Welcome back. Time now for news from the left. Congresswoman Cori Bush, one of our favorites, showing some prime time hypocrisy as usual. According to an itemized list of expenditures from Cori Bush for Congress found on the Federal Election Commission website, the radical left wing Democrat Congresswoman from Missouri has spent more than $300,000 on her own private security. One of the worst people on the planet. The progressive lawmaker spent $70,000 on security. So far this year, add that to 233,000 in 2021, and she spent uh, 304,000 on her own security in just the past election cycle. The same woman who told critics of her security expenditures to suck it up, relatedly following the violent shooting rampage in the Brooklyn subway station last week, you got another progressive making a move that uh, is pretty interesting. A letter signed by New York Congresswoman AOC back in 2019 has resurfaced showing how she and other progressives opposed the MTA's plan at the time to hire 500 more NYPD cops to patrol the subway system. In our view, desperately needed resources will be better invested in subway bus maintenance and service improvements. Yeah, don't put any cops down in the subway. AOC doesn't want them down there. Why would AOC want cops in the subway? She doesn't ride the subway. She goes in a caravan of, of black suburbans everywhere she goes, even though she's fighting for climate change. She doesn't care about the subway. You think AOC's been down there in the last five years? Hell no. It's one letter that did not age very well, especially considering the fact that according to the NYPD data in March alone, the number of crimes in the subway jumped 55% from the same period last year. I'm sure AOC would love to read her letter to all of her constituents that have been victimized in the subway. Women raped, thrown onto the subway tracks, beat up and robbed. That's who AOC's looking out for. Next up, a Brooklyn rapper running for the position of Democrat Party district leader in southern Brooklyn, oh, you can tell he's a lib already, shows his true colors on social media. Noah Weston's posts are covered with hate-filled anti-police rants calling officers effing pigs, plague rats, and sacks of S you know what, who do, no, who do more harm than good. He also echoes the progressive rally cry of defund the police. His most recent tweet saying, the greatest threats in this city are Eric Adams and the NYPD. So he's really left. According to the New York Post, Weston defends his cop bashing as justified. I would love to see that guy on the wrong end of a bad group of dudes or a pistol crying and peeing in his pants. Where are the police? Save me. Next up, as people celebrate the end of masks on planes, not everybody is happy about this decision. Check out this doctor tweeting out, Hi, United. When I bought my tickets for me, my wife who is pregnant, and our unvaccinated four-year-old, I assumed you would continue to have a mask mandate. Now you cancel it and we have to board our return flight under your new no-mask-required policy. Thanks so much. This is basically a doctor who is in support of wearing a mask effectively everywhere you go in public for the rest of your life. Because if you don't agree that right now we should get rid of this mandate, when will we? So this guy wants to wear a mask in public everywhere he goes for the rest of his life. And that's his position. Next up, according to one mathematics professor and former dean of the University of Michigan School of Education, being good at math is apparently racist. Yes, just being good at it. Professor Deborah Lowenberg Ball complains that math is a harbor for whiteness and the very nature of the knowledge uh, and who's produced it. And what has counted as mathematics is itself dominated by whiteness and racism. Take a listen. On one hand, what you can understand about mathematics is that, you know, at least in the U.S. society, the notion of being good at math and being intelligent are very tightly related. So that being good at math is seen as being just generally more smart. And if you don't have to go very far to trace that into the racialized history of how we see intelligence and intelligence testing to understand how raced the whole notion of being good at math becomes, in response to a rant, the host simply says, listening to you is the greatest positive reinforcement to be in this profession. Okay. Next up, things are starting to really heat up over in France as incumbent President Emmanuel Macron has taken a rather unexpected new strategy. They got the election coming up this Sunday, by the way, against Marine Le Pen. Uh, Macron's official photographer releasing a series of behind-the-scenes photos. In one, Macron has like a Steve Carell chest hair thing going on. I mean, I, th I think he killed a bear and is wearing it underneath his white shirt. Why he did this, who the hell knows? I don't know who he's trying to appeal to other than 
Well, I won't say anything. I'll probably get in trouble. That's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Just a bushel of chest hair. Vote for me. I've got more chest hair than Marine Le Pen. And finally, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has thrown her support behind her fellow Democrat congressman, uh, Charlie Crist, in the race for Florida's governor, the most impossible job in the world. Try to take that job from Ron DeSantis. Her reasoning is just fantastic. I've worked with Charlie for the past six years in Congress, and I've seen him fight for Floridians every single day. It's a stark contrast to the current governor. Florida, you deserve better. Yeah, you deserve better. You deserve a state like California or New York, somewhere you'd really want to live, you know, with rampant crime and, you know, no economy. I mean, that's just, that's just the greatest. Pelosi has given up. She's 1,045 years old, and she's finally given up. Finally, tonight, some perspective. Could Jack Dorsey be quietly rooting for Elon Musk in the battle over the company that he created? It seems very likely tonight. A couple tweets indicate Dorsey is just as critical of his former company's board as Elon Musk. The first, in response to a tweet about plots and coup attempts inside Twitter, Dorsey responded, it's consistently been the dysfunction of the company. Most don't know the full story, but in 2020, a hedge fund muscled its way onto Twitter's board, tried to push Dorsey out. Elon Musk voiced his support for Dorsey at that time. Dorsey ended up surviving that attempted ouster. In response to another tweet, that said, good boards don't create good companies, but a bad board will kill a company every time. Dorsey said, big facts. Now, currently, Jack Dorsey remains on the board of his former company after being shoved out as CEO. Dorsey owns only about 2% of Twitter, it might surprise you to hear, but he owns more than anyone else who's on the company's board. And Elon Musk owns the most at 9%. A group of people on that board, Dorsey clearly can't stand. Twitter was never perfect, of course, but Elon Musk thinks without Jack Dorsey, the censorship will get far worse. Musk once tweeted an image likening the new CEO, Pereg Agrawal, to Joseph Stalin, alleging that Agrawal pushed Dorsey right out of his own company. And new today, Musk indicating that if he's able to take over Twitter, the board will go unpaid, saving $3 million a year. That's a good one. Twitter's board is clearly against Elon's takeover, announcing Friday they were taking that poison pill, which would allow shareholders to buy more stock at a discount, diluting Musk's ownership if he were to take over. Now we're learning Elon may bring in partners to potentially uh, up his offer. The saga does continue. We will follow it.